Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Katarina Kovacevic. She is a PhD candidate in the Department of Cognitive Science at Central European University. Her main research interest is responsibility. She investigates how people ascribe responsibility for good and bad outcomes across various situations. And today we're focusing on uh, responsibility and strategic ignorance. So, Katarina, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Thank you. It's also a pleasure for me. <laughs> okay, so uh, actually this is very interesting because uh, I've already talked about responsibility with philosophers on the show, but not with someone who approaches it from a sort of uh, psychological slash cognitive science perspective. So. Uh, how do you approach responsibility from that perspective? And what kinds of questions are you trying to answer in your research, actually? Yeah, that's a good question to make some kind of a distinction in the approach of philosophers and psychologists uh, to these type of topics. Um, the main difference is that we in psychology approach from the descriptive perspective, which means that we don't want to say what is right, what is wrong, how people should ascribe responsibility in which cases, but rather how people do that. What are people's moral intuitions? Um, and um, when do they feel like it's um, um, good to, to um, ascribe responsibility? What are some relevant factors for them that influences uh, their intuitions and their, their decisions? And um, when we talk about the methodology, so how I approach this um, is uh, mostly through vignette studies, uh, which is when you write a certain story um, about some hypothetical agents, and then you ask the person um, some questions about their moral judgments, such as um, is the person responsible for the certain outcome um, in the story. And since I'm interested in um, different factors that can influence the ascription of responsibility, then I just vary uh, the context of the story, what the agent knew, what they didn't know, uh, what were their intentions, and similar to see whether that would trigger different intuitions, uh, moral intuitions in, in participants. Um, yeah, and also what psychologists do um, when investigating responsibility and some other moral judgments is, uh, especially in my department, because I'm a cognitive scientist, we um, discover the processes behind uh, this moral judgment. So what kind of cognitive process lies behind certain intuitions? In my case, I talk a lot about counterfactual thinking, for example, that is a thinking of possible alternatives. If this didn't happen, then something else wouldn't have happened. Um, so yeah, that's like a, a crash course on what... Um, psychologist does in uh, um, <laughs> in this type of a field yeah okay so let's get into some of your results and what we know about how people ascribe responsibility to others in different kinds of situations and so on so when exactly do people ascribe responsibility to others um so i will start first from a more bro broad answer so um, um, when I talk about responsibility, I, I talk mostly in my current research about responsibility for the negative outcome. Mm -hmm. um, then I see um, which factors influence um, people to ascribe responsibility more or less likely. So what are some kind of a mitigating factors in ascribing responsibility? And what I've been shown by now is that um, something that has been already known um, to an extent that epistemic states are a relevant factor. So whether the agent uh, knew what would be the possible consequences of their actions or they didn't know. So some kind of beliefs about the situation and what uh, could happen, the level of knowledge and information. Um, and um, moreover, which is not a factor that I that I varied in my study, but it is important to mention, is um, intentions that the agent have. Um, so if you have desire to harm the others, uh, then it's more likely that you will be ascribed as responsible uh, for uh, some kind of a bad outcome. 
But in my research, I mostly focus on um, this peculiar case of agents uh, who could have had the knowledge um, to see how people ascribe responsibility to them. Um, in um, so to see how people react to ignorant agents and how they uh, distinguish them from the people who have the knowledge. Um, yeah, because it's it's been shown like um, that when you have the knowledge, you're more likely to be responsible. But the fact that you're ignorant is not always exculpating. So that's interesting to see when it is and when it isn't exculpating. Yeah. So you're mostly interested here in epistemic responsibility, correct? Yeah, but just a bit of a disclaimer. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that philosophers will have a different definition of what epistemic responsibility is, uh, whether there's a duty to know enough about before forming certain attitudes. How I operationalize epistemic responsibility in my case is more something like epistemic duty which is um, duty to get informed before acting. Um, and that means that if you have a certain uh, sufficient care for, for other people, you, there is some kind of a normative expectation that you would uh, take certain precautionary measures or certain actions to get informed um, before uh, doing something that could harm others uh, or similar. So that is what I, I talk about when I talk about epistemic responsibility. So basically that there is, um, when you have sufficient care for others, you have epistemic intention, which is intention to learn the relevant information that leads to checking and that leads to preventing the, the negative outcome from happening because now you have the relevant adequate knowledge for that. Yes. So let's get a little bit into more detail here. So what if people act without relevant or sufficient knowledge in their possession? I mean, are they, are they held responsible or not? Or are they held responsible in particular situations and not others? How does it work exactly? Well, as uh, my BA professor like to say, uh, the best answer is it depends. <laughs> uh, but now I will, I will explain why it depends. Um, so what we know by now is that in a lot of cases, as I already mentioned to repeat, is that uh, being knowledgeable um, is um, more um, being, being more judgeable than, than having a lack of knowledge about certain situations. But the fact that you didn't know about something uh, is not enough um, in some cases. For example, you cannot say if you traveled to another country and you didn't buy the transport ticket, you cannot say, oh, I didn't know how to use the machine, um, which could be the truth that you didn't know how to exactly buy the ticket, but it was your, your obligation to get informed how to do that. Um, so, um, or when you produce some kind of um, uh, very bad uh, consequences, for example, you're a doctor and you didn't check some important allergy when you have prescribed the, 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 the medication, um, you cannot say, oh, I didn't know about that because it was kind of an obligation to get informed about that. Um, but what we show in, in our research as a very important factor in this case is whether there was an opportunity to learn the information. Mm -hmm. That is very important. Um, if there was no opportunity to learn the information, the relevant counterfactual, so this relevant alternative, is about some external factors. So if it would have been possible to learn the relevant information, then the person would have done that. But if there was the opportunity to learn something relevant, but you deliberately chose not to do that, then you're more likely to be ascribed as responsible. Um, and concretely, in our um, experiments, those agents who uh, didn't take the opportunity to learn that they had were um, they ascribed responsibility almost the same as the agents who knew about the possible negative consequences. For example, um, if uh, you see there is a sign that parking spots are maybe uh, reserved, 
but you don't really approach to check it because you're rushing for your dentist appointment. Um, that's seen as negative and you are ascribed as responsible. Um, statistically, even the same as, uh, as a person who sees that the, the spot is re uh, reserved, but just doesn't do anything about that. So there is something in this opportunity to learn that people um, take is important. Um, we interpret this as that um, people think about um, counterfactuals that are related to epistemic intentions. Mm -hmm. So to explain this a bit more, what I mean by this is that people think whether there would have been uh, an agent who had a better, um, more sufficient concern for others who would have done things differently. Okay. If there is an agent who uh, cared more about the welfare of others, um, would he um, check if, uh, if the spot is reserved? And if the answer is yes, then the person who didn't check if the spot was reserved is responsible. But then to complicate the story a bit more, we added some other factors in, in the question. So now we say, okay, the opportunity to learn the information is, is relevant. Um, but then we can ask, is a person always um, obliged to use that opportunity to learn something? Mm -hmm. And maybe intuitively, um, we are not expected to know everything about everything, right? So when it is very, it, it is more important uh, to get to get informed. And one of the interesting factors that 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 we write is how effortful this action of getting the the adequate information is. So with the hypothesis that if um, if the action is very effortful and too costly for the agent, uh, they, that will be some mitigating factor and uh, there will be less expectation from this agent to engage in the action that is very costly for them. Um, so um, we showed that, that this was a relevant factor and when there were two agents who both didn't engage um, in the um, action of checking, uh, the one who needed less effort uh, to do this action um, is, were, as, was described as, as more responsible. To give you an example, um, if you just need to read the sign uh, to check whether the spot is reserved or not, um, and you didn't engage in such a simple action that would not be costly for you, then you are ascribed responsible. But if this action involved waiting for a parking attendant to come and you don't know when he's coming and you're in a rush because you will um, miss your appointment, then a person, uh, people are a bit um, more um, empathizing with this situation and they ascribe uh, less responsibility. So in this case, when you come back to this counterfactual theory, we can say that even the agent who had sufficient care for others uh, maybe wouldn't um, check in this situation when the costs are too high. So there is kind of a benefit of a doubt given to this, to this person and we can say that the relevant counterfactual becomes if the action was not so effortful, then the agent would have done it. Um, yeah, so and there is some relevant factor, there are some um, other ones but let's say these, these are some, some of the most relevant. We also checked um, the, whether um, the probability of the negative outcome happening is what is relevant mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with the idea that if it is highly unlikely that something uh, negative would happen, are you still asked to, to check um, and to, to put some uh, put some effort in order to to check what is uh, what is the relevant information about that event or to prevent. Um, but this factor didn't uh, seem to be uh, relevant. I mean, there are maybe reasons that uh, the probabilities that we had were still 
above some threshold ab about which it is expected from people to act. So if it, even if it's like 30-40% probability of something negative happening, if the action is so uh, effortless, such as just reading the sign, you're expected to do it if you can prevent some harm to others. But this factor is still a bit uh, something that that is that should be researched more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, it's not the case that people always hold people responsible if they haven't gathered all the relevant information. It depends. Uh, I mean, a little bit on how much effort you have to put into it to gather all the relevant information. But I, w I mean, in terms of the effort, I would imagine that there are particular instances where people, even if it would take a lot of effort, would still hold you responsible. I, I, I mean, just one clear, I guess, example that comes to mind is in uh, health-related situations. I mean, if a doctor for some reason uh, gets across a patient with a very rare condition and just because it's very rare and it would take him or her a lot of uh, gather a lot of time to gather enough information to mm -hmm. really understand how that rare condition works and how it might interfere with treatments and other uh, comorbidities for example uh, people Probably uh, people in that specific case, because they're dealing with a supposed expert, would be less lenient in terms of, uh, I mean, not holding them responsible, particularly if something bad uh, happens because of that. Yes, um, yes, that's, that's uh, very important what you're saying. Um, I see two relevant things there in your example. One is um, the responsibility that comes with the obligations, with the roles. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about the normative expectations of certain roles. So um, like doctors, lawyers, or some certain um, roles in the society that are connected to some certain behaviors. And we expect more, more uh, from a doctor, especially in this situation, than of some person who is not an expert in the field and didn't oblige to help others and similar. The other relevant factor that I see there is mostly when we talk about health and especially in this situation where there is a serious rare disease, we talk about a very severe outcomes. Um, and this is something, this effect of severity of the outcome is something that has been studied uh, um, in some other contexts um, uh, when, for example, negligence. Um, and it, it does make a difference. People ascribe more moral blame uh, to agents who, uh, who produce more severe um, outcomes. Um, but in this context, when we talk about ignorant agents who didn't get informed and some, something bad happened, um, then that, that's a factor that I would, I would uh, like to, uh, to investigate in some of my future experiments. What my intuition about it uh, is now is that people are um, computing the, the utilities. And maybe this now sounds, uh, sounds weird, well, maybe this is a behavioral economist side of me. Um, but I believe that people do um, um, consider uh, the benefits, cost, costs and benefits. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, when um, the potential harm is so severe, then um, the ratio between uh, the cost for the agent who needs to put some effort is still lower than the cost uh, the, uh, of, uh, of the agent who would suffer uh, from uh, the lack of this prevention. So in this case, um, the more severe the outcome is, I believe that people hold more expectations from agents to check the relevant information. Um, I cannot claim this as for my, for my data, but it is my, my, my strong intuition about this. Um, so let's see, maybe some uh, next time I can, <laughs> I can give you a like, empirical answer uh, to that question. Um, but yeah, this, this is what I, uh, what I think uh, for now.
Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll get back to outcomes in a second, but let me just ask you one related uh, ring relevant information, because I was just thinking about what people usually consider relevant information to be. I, I mean, of course, we would have to look perhaps at specific cases, specific examples, but for example, going back to the case of actor, I mean, relevant information, what if for some reason the person uh, cannot have access to particular kinds of relevant information, or if what people think is relevant information is not even there, because, for example, we don't know enough about a particular disease. It has not been studied enough. There are particular uh, aspects of it that we don't know about yet. So, uh, I mean, uh, basically what I'm trying to understand is uh, what people tend to consider relevant information, basically. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, one um, one thing that I would like to mention here is that um, the factor that I was uh, I was uh, talking about previously is this opportunity to learn. And of course, there is no opportunity to get some information. Um, even the doctor wouldn't be uh, found responsible if there is just no the medicine did not develop to the extent that could help a person or there is no medication available in a certain context. And uh, of course, in these case, situations when there is no opportunity to act differently, uh, then the, the relevant counterfactuals are about some external factors, right? But this question, what is the relevant information? Uh, I mean, I'm going to get a bit uh, theoretical, but when I talk about what the relevant information is, I talk about information that has the power to change the outcome. Okay. Um, and that's true what you say, that it's not always obvious what type of information uh, could change the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if you're a doctor and you need to uh, check for multiple options, then you don't know exactly which information would answer your questions. But if we talk about... Um, some other interpersonal relations. Uh, for example, um, you want to take a car of your sibling um, that you share. Um, the relevant information would be, does my sibling need a car for today? Um, and um, you would call, call them to check um, about this. So uh, sometimes what is the relevant information is very obvious, uh, such as in the case of um, checking, what, reading the parking sign and reading if the spot is, is reserved or not, can you park there or not, and the relevant information is yes or no, right? Uh, because that could change the course of the outcome if a person uh, who needs this space cannot park there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, I mean, I, I agree, in some situations, uh, what is relevant to be known uh, is not so obvious, yeah. That's true. Yeah, and going back to the outcomes, because we've already talked here about how uh, if it's a severe outcome, people usually tend to ascribe more responsibility to the person. But what if uh, people get a good outcome, even if they didn't hold uh, the relevant information, that it was just a good outcome basically by chance. The, does that matter to people or not? Mm -hmm. um, but do you mean there whether a person would be responsible um, or for... for I, I mean, if in that case, so let's say that uh, they, get, they got a good outcome, but later people learn that it was mostly by chance because the person didn't really uh, have uh, the relevant information. I mean, they just basically did things, they went into it uh, blind, let's say, and they got a good outcome. I mean, the, does that matter? Do people care about that at all or not? I mean, the, does mm -hmm. that over, uh, is that more important to people than the fact that they just got a good outcome or not? Um, that, that's a good question. When we talk about responsibility, 
the way I define responsibility is that uh, some certain outcome is needed because responsibility can be seen as a um, response to something. So when something happens, we can talk about who is uh, responsible for that certain outcome. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other moral judgments that would take these uh, mental states more into account. And that, uh, for example, um, um, Cushman, Fieri Cushman is talking about um, this, how for um, judgments of blame and punishment, outcome is, is uh, what is very important and more important than when we talk about the judgment of moral wrongness, for example. Mm -hmm. So in this case, when somebody, um, even when there is no negative outcome, we can still maybe not talk about whether the person is responsible because nothing bad happened, but we can talk about whether they acted morally wrongly um, for not gathering the right information, such as a doctor who didn't really check for some relevant conditions before giving the medication that could have produced some negative consequences. So in that case, I wouldn't talk about responsibility, but I could talk about whether it was right or wrong uh, not to have a certain information. Um, that is the case of, for example, uh, drunk driving. You can be morally judged for driving drunk, even if you came home safely by pure luck, right? Yeah. So we can we can judge this action and your behavior as not being the good one, but we cannot make you responsible for an outcome that didn't happen, right? Um, this is my take on this, that uh, when I talk about responsibility, in this case, I talk about uh, the responsibility for something that happened. Um, some people would maybe talk about responsibility like... Um, and that assigning responsibility to people to do certain actions, like some kind of obligations. But um, I talk mostly about the, um, the responsibility for the harm uh, that, that happened in this case. But for sure, we can talk about whether the, 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 the lack of knowledge uh, was bad, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So let's get now into strategic ignorance, since we're talking about also epistemic responsibility here, I guess that this ties very well to that. So what is strategic ignorance exactly? Yes. So we talked about different situations in which agents are ignorant, right? And there can be multiple causes why somebody um, was left ignorant. Strategic ignorance is this specific situation uh, when uh, people are using, as Dan and colleagues say, this moral wiggle room. Uh, what it means? It means that since we talked about how in um, a lot of cases, the fact that you didn't, didn't know that something bad can happen can uh, mitigate the responsibility, people can use this space to say, oh, I didn't know such as this case with not buying a transport ticket. Oh, I didn't know how to buy a transport ticket. Um, so I'm, I'm not responsible for, um, I shouldn't be punished for this, right? So strategic ignorance is ignoring some relevant information in order to run away from uh, the responsibility of, of your actions. Um, in my case, we call it willful ignorance. But still, in these cases uh, that I mentioned to you, such as a person not checking the um, parking sign, uh, we can say that the person did that on purpose so that they are not late for their appointment. Because in this case, they would need to change uh, the spot. Uh, they would uh, need to repark and lose some time. So they strategically ignore this in order not to be uh, not to feel morally obliged to change their actions. That's the idea. Um, either to themselves um, or to other people. So basically to save some kind of a positive picture of themselves or they want other people to think more positively of them. So if you say, oh, I didn't know I took somebody else's spot, um, it's not the same as saying, oh, yeah, I, I knew that was reserved, but I didn't care, right? Um, and there are interesting experiments of, of Dan and colleagues um, 
you know, dictator games. Um, so these economic games where um, you give certain um, um, certain um, outcomes for people. If you get six points, a person will or six dollars, a person will get one dollar. But uh, if you choose to have um, five dollars, a person will also have five dollars. And then you are asked to choose which outcome uh, would would you prefer. Um, and basically, what these type of games are testing is whether there is some kind of a, a prosociality. So whether people would uh, also think about other people's welfare and not only their own, right? Um, and when you show this information transparent like that, so what is the outcome for you and for the other person? Um, people in a lot of cases um, are doing choosing a pro-social answer. So choosing such as that they maximize or optimize the, the welfare for the other person. So what they would rather choose rather choose five for both than six for them and one for the other person. But what's interesting is that if you cover um, what is the outcome for the other person and you say it's 50% chance that it's either one or five. Um, so a person who chooses doesn't know what would be the possible outcome for the other person. And then the question is, um, they, the people have the opportunity to cover, to uncover this and to learn what would be the outcome for the other person. So they have this like uh, reveal, reveal part. And the, a lot of people, they don't choose to reveal. That's the thing. Uh, less than 60% of, um, of people choose to reveal what would be the outcome for the other person. And why they do this? So they, they, conti they can continue choosing more for them without feeling bad because they have some kind of a benefit of a doubt or this moral wiggle room. So you say, oh, I chose more for me, but I didn't know what the other person would get. And they can, be, they can save their self, uh, self picture and also how other people see them. They can, be remain, they, they can remain see, perceived as, as a fair person. That, that's the idea of that. Of course, if they choose to reveal, then people would uh, choose an option that uh, mostly choose the option that maximizes also the benefit for the other person. Um, so this type of strategic ignorance is, is, is very interesting. Um, but now in real life, some examples, apart from this not reading the parking uh, sign and parking mm -hmm. wherever you want, are um, even some like health related things like you are you don't want to know how bad smoking actually is because uh, with smoking or you don't want to learn particular information about your group that you belong to because you don't want to um, think more about your group identity and reconsider it um, and uh, or for example you don't want to see how much how many um sugar how much sugar your favorite drink has because you just want to continue drinking it um and similar so people do this in in a lot of cases that they're related to others or, or just related to themselves and um yeah um in to be able to uh, to continue with doing what they want to do but still um, having some nice, some good picture about themselves. And it's also a problem with some certain ec ecological behaviors that people are ignoring how they affect the community, the, 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 the ecology, uh, because changing their behavior to start recycling, um, et, et cetera, can be effortful and not something that they want to change. Um, Maybe some people would call this rather deliberate ignorance than strategic ignorance. Mm -hmm. So this uh, terminology is sometimes a bit confusing because you have uh, strategic ignorance, deliberate ignorance, willful ignorance, uh, etc. Maybe I would say the strategic ignorance is more concerned with this uh, that relates for others to others, mm -hmm. such as kind of a this justification why you did something or being perceived as positive in the 
eyes of other people, but may, so maybe I would call deliberate ignorance um, these uh, behavior that are related uh, to your health choices and stuff. Um, Hertwig and people from the Max Planck Institute for Human Development have a lot of papers on deliberate ignorance, um, and then they use this terminology. Um, so, so yeah, those are some also some interesting literature to check on this topic who is more interested yeah yeah great so uh, this will probably be my last uh, question but i would also like to get into a perhaps some a more concrete example a health care related example you also, you also mentioned health there so because there are particular cases and i also read about this in the literature where people actually use strategic ignorance but are really a little bit more severe in terms of the possible outcomes it can have. And I mean, people, when they read about it, many people think, oh my God, why would people do that? So when it comes to, for example, uh, sexually transmitted infections or STIs, there are actually cases where people, I mean, they might uh, think that they might have been exposed to an STI and they might have got it, but they don't want to get tested uh, in that particular case. And sometimes it might be something very serious like AIDS or something like that. So, uh, and in that particular case, I guess that people find it a bit weird, that kind of literature, because I mean, if it's, for example, uh, tobacco use, or if you're uh, consuming too much su sugar, people might think that, okay, that's not great, but at least you're not affecting other people or potentially harming other people. It's just yourself. But in that particular case, uh, I mean, there's a very big potential there that you will be harming other people. And in that specific, I mean, it, it could be the case that in a particular case, you were exposed accidentally uh, an STI. I mean, it, it could have not been transmitted sexually and you didn't know at all. And so that's a different thing. But if you it think that you might have got it, then I mean, that's completely different, right? So wh yes. why, do, why do people uh, do that exactly? That's a great uh, comment. Now I can get a bit more personal as to why did they choose to start working on this topic. That is not exactly the example that you mentioned, but um, how this question of how much should we know, how much should we check, how much should we care of not affecting other people, all these questions were always some kind of a my interest um, and this concern for others. But when we talk about health, it especially arose when I moved to Austria. So um, disclaimer, I moved to Austria in the time of COVID, so 2021. And in Austria, the lockdown measures, the COVID testing measures were very severe. So I moved from Serbia where PCR tests were not possible to be done by your own choice, only if you have symptoms. If you wanted to do it, just to check if you maybe were exposed uh, or you think that uh, you were exposed or similar, you needed to pay 60 euros, let's say. Then I moved to Austria where testing is the easiest thing ever. You just do it at your home. It's for free. You can do it every day at the time when I moved. And then I felt obliged to do the test almost every day because I felt what is the justification of not doing the test? It's for free. It's easy. There is no reason not to do it. So I felt even a bit obsessed with, with this because I felt so responsible to check, right? Right. Um, and then I was asking this question, so why do I feel like this? You know, how this moving changed these expectations for myself so much? And... Um, and yeah, I mean, this kind of a, um, um, thinking that maybe you are, uh, you have the disease or similar can be translated to the example that, that you mentioned. And indeed, this uh, question of transmissible, sexually transmissible diseases is very, very important. Um, and I think, I'm not sure 
uh, we could ask legal um, practitioners, but uh, that even transmitting, uh, transmitting some serious uh, sexually transmittable diseases is um, is illegal if it, not to to to, dis, to disclose that you have them, right? Um, so it's a very serious problem, um, and um, of course here we have the similar um, motivation for not checking, which is um, in case of some uh, transmittable diseases, um, is that you want to continue um, doing what you want. Um, which is having some 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 pleasure, and you don't want to talk about that. You don't want to maybe stop for some time, uh, and similar. Um, and then this, there is this strategic motivation. I'm not gonna check because then I can continue doing what I'm doing, um, and I don't feel so guilty about it, right? The other part of that um, that doesn't include this lack of care for others which I would say it's a lack of care for others. If you um, have a serious suspicion, especially, that you could be um, infected, but you don't check. The other part of that um, is connected with the emotional regulation, which is also a case with some other diseases um, that people don't want to know if they are sick. Uh, so even if they have some symptoms, they uh, are afraid of uh, some um, some negative information, especially if you if if some very serious transmittable diseases are in question, that you maybe feel uh, afraid to learn uh, that you have some of them, um, and this fear is stopping you from from checking. Um, but of course, I mean, what my research would say about that is that. Um, if there is some reason to, to be suspicious, especially, and uh, if you have um, an, a sufficient care for others, that uh, it is expected, like that you would have, have checked, especially if it's, uh, if it's available to you. But since if we talk about something very serious, then I get to go back to my question. People would consider the utility and if it's, a, it's an important uh, topic as such here, transmittable diseases, you could put a bit more effort uh, to find out whether you have something that could harm others. Yeah, and in the particular case of uh, STIs, for example, uh, and in the law, I, I mean, of course, I'm not a law expert nor anything like that, and I don't know lo the laws of different countries, but I would imagine just intuitively uh, someone simply suspecting that they might have been infected and not testing uh, in the eyes of the law would be different than actually having tested and know for sure that you have the disease and still continue on with the behavior and infecting other people because in the first case you might still have some plausible deniability, right? Yes, um, yes that's true and uh, as far as I know as I think I know, um, this uh, like um, punishment, uh, like legal punishment for that behavior is only in the case if you know. Um, but since I was working on this case of willful ignorance, I was reading a lot even about some uh, philosophy of law and some law articles. And in some cases, some philosophers even claim um, that in some cases, the willful ignorance can be perceived similarly to knowledge, uh, because in in view of the mens rea, which is this guilty mind, and if there was a sufficient suspicion yeah. um, that that you could have checked, that could be also punishable. I think it depends on the country, on the legal system. It's a question whether it's just like um, now some kind of a dis open discussion. I'm not sure exactly about this because, again, I'm not a legal practitioner, just interested in this topic. So uh, I come uh, to read some, some certain stuff like this. Um, but, uh, yeah, in some cases, being um, having a reasonable suspicion, such in this case, is your three ex-partners of yours told you that they have HPV uh, or you have some certain symptoms of it. 
I'm not sure how this particular case would be treated in the legal system um, uh, or uh, when we talk about um, some some other diseases um, but uh, but that that um, this reasonable suspicion can sometimes be even enough um, yeah maybe not in this health context but in some other context when you're harming others or killing someone accidentally um, and it's similar maybe in these cases this having enough reasons to to be suspicious uh, could could lead to uh, more severe judgments yes mm -hmm. yeah you know, the only reason why i brought that distinction to the table between uh, actually knowing that you have the disease and just suspecting that you might have it but not uh, really testing is that uh, psychologically speaking and from the perspective of psychology and cognitive science perhaps uh, for people who actually do not care about harming others and just want to go on having fun or something like that then in the case where they don't test I, I mean in their own self-interest uh, it would be better for them because that because then they would if they already do not care about harming others then adding to that they would have more plausible deniability because oh yeah. i didn't even actually test it so i didn't know that's sure. the idea of this moral wiggle room and that was strategic strategic ignorance is using this fact that sometimes not knowing Mm -hmm. uh, is mitigating your uh, moral judgment towards you and you're using this moral wiggle room of not you saying oh I didn't know exactly yeah. there's a problem but what I want to claim there is that well that's that's not always the excuse you know maybe you yeah. were supposed to know maybe you were supposed to care more and then if you cared more then you would know and uh, yeah, some, some philosophers would agree with this um, um, because what we do sometimes as, as moral psychologists, we um, can take some, some notions from, from philosophy, some uh, prescriptive theories, and then test them empirically. And uh, some people do talk about the quality of will and uh, this uh, recognizing whether the agent uh, had uh, in consideration the, the the welfare of others, even if they uh, come to produce some negative outcomes, um, they they would be uh, not judged as blameworthy or responsible. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I, I I want to to study this more in my future research, this prosociality and care for others, um, and how it influences some certain decisions that we make and certain expectations uh, from people. Um, yeah, I think it's important to take other people into because I mean, that's my personal value, I would say. Uh, taking some other people in the consideration when you make certain decisions and then to see what, to what extent it is, uh, it is reasonable, to what extent people, uh, people think it is reasonable. Um, yeah, let's say, let's say like that. Okay, great. So let's leave it. Uh, let's leave that as perhaps a teaser for a possible future conversation once you've finished your PhD. So just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Um, yes. So we recently published a preprint that um, is um, called "You Should Have Checked." and uh, the importance of epistemic intentions in description of responsibility um, with my co-authors Francesca Bonalumi and Christoph Heinz, my supervisor. Um, also, you can find me on the ACES, um, like the cards, ACES uh, <laughs> page uh, at CEU, which is the, the name of my lab. Um, um, so, so yeah, um, those are some, some places you can find me and there you can see my email address on the CU website. Um, so yes, if you, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to, uh, to uh, email me. Yes, for sure. Or okay. always on LinkedIn, you can find me. So I'm, I'm on multiple <laughs> locations. <laughs> Okay, great. So look, Katerina, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks.
<laughs> okay, great. So look, Katerina, thank you so much again for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You can find the links in the description box down below. And if you like the interview, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button and comment. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development and differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, then Demetri, Robert Windega, Rui Nassi, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Kavana, Mirk, Mikkel Stormer, Samuel Landre, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Fergal Cusson, Harl Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Nyar, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Eira, Tom Hamel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladez Araújo, Ruben Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punta, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicola Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Jorge Stiofanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amaury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Ho Old Herrigbon, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zool, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Perk Rawley, Kate Von Goller, Alexander Hubbard, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, and Mike Levine. A special thanks to my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egden, Bernard Ugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carl Montenegro, Alni Cortez and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, Bogdan Canivets, and Rosie. Thank you for all. <laughs>